Okay, the reading for this week is a story about Yoshiyuki Junnosuke, one of the great post-war writers who's often uh, associated with the third wave, Daisan no Shinjin. They're called the third wave of new writers who came uh, to prominence in the post-war period. He's associated with this group. He was born in 1924, died in 1994. There's uh, more detailed information about his life and his works in the description on your study guide. You can review all that, but just keep in mind that he's often associated or described as a, an eye novelist. So we can read these works, starting with Shofu no Hea, and consider it in the context of the I novel, the Watakushi Shosetsu. Are these examples of the Watakushi Shosetsu? Can they be read in that mode, or should we read them entirely in a different mode, sort of in the context of uh, the Yukaku or Demimon literature, for example, of the Edo period as a kind of extension of that in a, within the um, sort of a context of Nagai Kafu and these other writers who took the old traditions from the Edo period and kind of brought them into the present with their focus on the uh, Demimon life, the pleasure quarters, prostitutes, and so forth. Um, this work, Yosh, uh, Prostitute's Room, is the literal translation of Shofu no Hea, published in 1958 in a uh, literary journal, translated by Howard Hibbett as Akiko's Room, and this, uh, was his translation was included in uh, his work, I have it somewhere back here, the big fat green book, uh, Contemporary Japanese Literature, an Anthology of Fiction, Film, and Other Writings Since 1945. I'll have the link to that uh, in the description below. It's on your study guide as well as well as links to the uh, original Japanese, so you can purchase it. These are fairly recent works, so they're not included in the Aozora Bunko online free site. Uh, you'll have to buy them, but you can find them at any bookstore in Japan for 100 yen or 200 yen, very cheap. All right, um, the detailed information about his writings, you can find that. He won the Akutagawa Show in 1955, just keep that in mind, for his work Shu U, which is translated as Downpour. Um, the Akutagawa Show, or the Akutagawa Prize, of course, is the uh, sort of preeminent literary prize for fiction in Japan, established shortly after Akutagawa Ryunosuke's death in 1927, and he was awarded that in 1955. Um, and, um, okay, there's more detailed information. We can skip that. Let me go to the study guide questions, and then I will turn the microphone over to Nicole, and she will read um, the entirety of the entire Translation by Howard Hibbett. It's a short story, so it should take about 20 minutes or so. Um, study question number one. These are sort of uh, thrown together right before my class, which I have to run to right now, so it's a little rough. I'll polish them up a bit and um, post them online and put the link to uh, the study guide in the description below. Study question number one. Describe the narrative structure of the work. What is the point of view? How much time has elapsed between the narrative present, in which the narrator is... Uh, telling his story, and the events that the narrator described. Is, is he looking back on the distant past, or is it something fairly recent? Figure that out. There are several hints in the story. Number two, do you think this work qualifies as an example of the Watakushi Shosetsu, or the I novel? If so, is it more Chowagata, the harmony model, or Hametsugata, the self-destructive model? Remember that uh, Hirano Ken, one of the uh, important critics, literary critics of the post-war period, uh, divided the Watakushi Shosetsu into these two general trends. The Chowagata, the more harmonious model, uh, exemplified by uh, Shiga Naoya and other writers who kind of have this harmonious attitude toward nature and so forth. And then the sort of more wild ones who kind of destroy their own lives through debauchery and so forth, and then uh, record those uh, debaucherous events and so forth in their works. And he calls that the Hametsugata, or the self-destructive mode. Is this an example of the harmonious mode or the self-destructive mode, or, or sort of a combination of both? Explain. Number three, describe the narrator. His occupation, so obviously it's a first-person narrator, uh, describe this protagonist narrator. His occupation, his personality, he's kind of an, a maimbo or a botchan. He's obviously of a different status than the uh, prostitutes that he uh, encounters. Um, he seems like he's from a, an elite uh, private school that he just graduated from. His personality, his age, I'll give you a hint, he's 25, that's the answer. Uh, his fears, what does he fear, what does he desire, his class status, his education his insecurities, his ex past experiences with women. This is a very important thing to keep in mind. He mentions them on a few occasions, and they relate to what he's uh, doing at the present or what he's describing himself doing. Um, his weaknesses, jealousy, for example. He's prone to jealousy, and he divides jealousy into two types, keep in mind. Uh, his violent tendencies, which kind of flare up on certain occasions, and so forth. Describe all these elements of the character. Does he remind you of any recurring literary archetypes that we have encountered? So keep in mind sort of archetypes of the Koshoku uh, Otoko and the Irogonomi Otoko and stuff from the classical Japanese past in the Edo period, and uh, consider whether he resembles any of these archetypes in any way. 
Uh, why does he feel a kinship with whores, as he puts it? How do he and Akiko mir mirror each other? So the uh, main female character, the prostitute, Akiko, and uh, the protagonist, narrator protagonist, kind of resemble each other in certain ways. How do they mirror each other despite their different stations in uh, the social status and their different backgrounds? What drives him to want to haunt the pleasure district so often, even after Akiko quits it? Does he experience any growth or change, uh, either emotional or social, in social status in the course of his uh, narrative? Explain. Number four, describe the yukaku. The yukaku is an important word in Japanese culture, Japanese literature. It's the uh, demimond, or the pleasure district. What is the yukaku for the narrator protagonist? Note that the meaning of the yukaku, of the pleasure district, shifts throughout the story. And I think it passes through three stages you can probably divide it into. Um, we'll go over the answer to that in class. So think of the shifting meaning of the yukaku for the narrator. Um, in the, in the beginning, for example, it's a place of solace and so forth, and then it goes to a place of violence, and then it returns to a place of refuge and so forth. And at the very end of the story, of course, he becomes disillusioned by it altogether. The magic is gone. He sees it kind of on, with different eyes, and he's no longer pulled into it. So explain this transformation that he goes through and uh, the shifts that in the meaning of the yukaku, the demi -won. Number five. Describe the cabinet minister's wife and her interest in physiognomy, or nin sogaku, as we say in Japanese, phrenology. Uh, this was known as in 19th century Europe. Uh, what is this, the relevance of this woman who's interested in physiognomy to the rest of the story? Number six, discuss the main female character of the work, namely Akiko, her hopes, her fears, her mindset, her class status, her vulnerability, her physical appearance, her physical condition. Note that her physical condition kind of deteriorates uh, throughout this, toward the end of the story. Her various jobs and roles that she performs. Remember, she quits uh, prostitution at one point and starts something else and doesn't work out and then ends up back in prostitution at the very end. Why does she return to prostitution at the end? Is it for money? Is she uh, some kind of nymphomaniac? Is it out of necessity? Uh, how does she differ or depart from other prostitute stereotypes, right? So obviously when Yoshiyuki Jinosuke is writing this story. He has other sort of uh, char recurring character types of the prostitute in his head, maybe from French literature of the 19th century. How does this uh, Akiko resemble those other uh, sort of archetypes? How does she differ from it? Has her noose darkened? Noose darkened, of course, is a phrase from um, Paul in the New Testament in his letters. He talks about the darkening of noose. It seems like this female character has uh, her noose or her spirit or her... Kokoro has darkened over the years from her experiences as a prostitute. Explain that. Does she change after quitting prostitution? Why does she go back at the end? Will she ever, ashio arao, as we say in Japanese, wash her feet of this industry? What is her job at the end of the story? Explain. Number seven, what is the role or the function of kudo, kudo da sang, her middle-aged client in the story? Is he, does he have a positive or negative effect on her, influence on her? What is his role in the story? Number eight, the first person narrator protagonist makes a distinction between normal romantic love sex, which is linked to procreation, and love sex in the pleasure quarters, which is completely cut off from the procreative function. How are they different? How, uh, um, how does the author represent them in different ways? Um, obviously, the uh, love, romantic love and so forth, is associated with the symbolic. It's associated with, it's subject to innumerable stories, as he puts it in the story, in the work. And then versus the traumatic real, the sort of cut off from the symbolic world, cut off from the social, and it's just this kind of intense pursuit of pleasure. And this, uh, the narrator seems to make a, a kind of sharp division between these two, uh, two, I guess you could say, dimensions of eros. Right? Um, which does he feel more drawn to and why? And why is he unable to sort of um, go in the direction of the more normal uh, social uh, romantic love and so forth? Number nine. Note the tension between the reality of life in the demimonde and the performance or the fantasy or the illusion that the demimonde creates, right? So um, this is something you see in a lot of Sharebon, for example, of the Edo period, where there'll be little glimpses. It's the demimonde, uh, the yukaku, for example, the Yoshiwara pleasure quarters in Edo period uh, were kind of this land of fantasy, and they would uh, strive to create that fantasy. But occasionally, every now and then, in the works of Santo Kyoden, for example, you'd see little glimpses of the actual reality, which are very, very different than the fantasy that the whole uh, world seeks to create. And you see that kind of tension between the reality and the fantasy in this work as well. 
This is a central theme in all demi monde literature, not just of the Edo period and uh, Showa and Taisho and so forth, but also in France and in Europe and so forth. How does this theme operate in this story? Where do we see glimpses of the reality? For example, the strikingly beautiful woman that he encounters at the uh, train station, who's uh, usually standing with her breasts held high, he says, whom he sees at the train station. But here, when he encounters her at the train station, she has a baby strapped to her back, looking old and haggard. And we see a brief glimpse into the reality rather than the fantasy. Discuss that issue. Number 10, how does the work fit in the context of demimon literature, or yukaku, bungaku in general? Think of the Edo period gesaku works. The, uh, Sort of frivolous writing is a literal translation of gesaku, which is a kind of large umbrella term that covers all of the major categories of sort of playful fiction of the Edo period, such as the shade bone and the ninjo bone and so forth. And think of the Edo period gesaku works that we read in this class, for example, Santo Kyoden's Nishiki no Uda, or uh, before that, in the um, earlier part of the first half of the Edo period, we have Ihara Saikaku's Ukiyo Zoshi, for example as well as their modern descendants, such as Tanizaki Junichiro. You'll remember we read Shisei, or The Tattooer, uh, which is set in the Edo period demi monde, the pleasure quarters. Nagai Kafu, of course, was obsessed with the pleasure quarters and spent his whole life pursuing it and visiting it and writing about it in his works. How does this work relate to this larger category of the yukaku, bungaku in general? Are the key cultural antithetical concepts of iki and yabo these are two very important terms, underline them now. Iki, of course, means chic or erotic sophistication or cool detachment. This is kind of the ideal that the uh, tsu, the tsu jing, or the uh, sort of sophisticate would uh, aim to cultivate in himself when going to the uh, pleasure quarters and uh, associating with the prostitutes and so forth. And the yabo is the opposite. Yabo is the opposite of iki, and this is boorishness. It's the person who tries to be cool and so forth when he goes to the uh, pleasure quarters and um, associates with the courtesans, but he's not very good at it, and he's uh, kind of despised by all of the courtesans. So is this uh, antithetical, are these antithetical concepts of iki and yabo present in this story? Is the narrator protagonist associated with iki? Is he more iki or yabo? Explain. And finally, make a list of the particularities of culture that appear in the story and describe. For example, we have the Tori no Ichi festival, and so forth. All right, so every time something comes up that you're not familiar with, write it down, look it up. All right, that's all. That's a lot of questions. Um, no, 11 questions. We will go over the answers to all of those in class, and I will see you then. Now I shall turn the microphone over to Nicole. In Akiko's room. Shofu Nohea, 1958. That day I took my dusty college uniform out of the closet and put it on for the first time in a year. I was no longer a student. I was supporting myself as a reporter on a scandal magazine. While I had been working there part-time, the editor told me to make up my mind whether I wanted a regular job or not. Without hesitation, I decided to drop out of school. I didn't withdraw formally, though, so I suppose I was still on the college rolls. But I felt awkward in my old uniform. Sure enough, I could see in the mirror that it didn't fit very well. Now that I had gone out into society to work, now that I had become a full-fledged adult, I seemed to bulge out of it. I straightened my back, set my mouth in a firm line, and tried to look as innocent as my school uniform. Then I left the rooming house. I had an assignment to interview the wife of a cabinet member who was said to be involved in corruption. I was to see her instead of her husband because she was the more colorful of the two, a strong-minded woman who had stirred up her own share of gossip. Her dislike of reporters was well known, and I had every reason to fear that I wouldn't get beyond the door. I had to devise a stratagem. Collecting every scrap of information I could find, I had sketched a mental portrait of her. I decided to wear my school uniform, since it was from a prestigious college. Also, I kept in mind that she was a passionate devotee of physiognomy. While with other business, it was evening by the time I stood at the minister's massive, tight-shut door. Meeting strangers was always painful for me. Stealing my nerves, I made a stab at the doorbell. A faint chime echoed somewhere within the large mansion. A maid appeared. I gave her my calling card and asked to see her mistress. She withdrew, and the minister's wife came to the door holding my card with her fingertip. I wonder if I might speak to you for a moment, I said in my best student's manner. The minister's wife looked me over from head to toe, scrutinized the insignia on my collar, emblems, and jacket buttons, and then led me into a parlor. Is it true that you belong to the Tokyo School of Physiognomy, madam? I inquired, launching immediately into her favorite subject. During the war, I had studied that method of physiognomy myself. In those days, I made it a practice not to believe anything people said, but to concentrate on their expression at the moment they spoke. Perhaps I was trying to show them that I didn't believe in words. My question did the trick. Gradually warming to the subject, the minister's wife chattered on so enthusiastically that I couldn't get a word in. Froth gathered at the corners of her mouth as she began delving into the history of physiognomy. Then, Abbot Takuan would glare into the other man's eyes, 
She froze, staring straight at me, just as she was gesturing to emphasize her point. Then she took my card from the table and carefully examined it. The card didn't identify me as a reporter, but the name of the magazine was printed in small type on its left-hand corner. The next moment, she was in a rage. So you're a reporter? I thought you were a student going on about physiognomy that way. What are you here for? I loathe reporters. Always spying on people to find out what they had for lunch and all that? No, get out! Fast! She rose and came towards me menacingly. I stood up, resigned to the fact that the interview was over. As I was putting on my shoes in the entryway, she kept after me. Get out! As I opened the door, I heard the click of a switch. She had turned off the porch light. That's the way it goes, I muttered to myself, forcing a smile. I tried to look at it from her point of view, but I still felt humiliated. I went on downtown and stopped for a drink near the station. Before long, I began to feel like myself again. When I left the bar, my steps took me toward the quarter where the streets were lined with brothels. I caught sight of Akiko standing in front of her house. She was waiting for one of the men going by to notice her and stop. I went straight up to her, nodded hello, and followed her into the house. When we were face to face in her room, she murmured something that took me by surprise. You look like a beaten dog. I do? Yes. What a thing to say. You're always like that when you come in my room. By the time you leave, you're a little more human. But you're pretty hard on me in between. Do you only come here when something's wrong? I didn't answer. Her words set me thinking. I meant to dispel all traces of my humiliation, not to be a taunted man hurrying for solace to the quarter of a taunted woman. I had thought of myself as sauntering tipsily into the quarter, enticed by the desire for pleasure. And now that pose was shattered. Suddenly I could see myself as I looked in her eyes. Hunched over, I would come slinking along towards her as she stood there in front of her house. I would go into her room like a beaten dog and then turn brutal and devour her body. I had no intention of using brute force with Akiko. Yet I couldn't help thinking she was right. Maybe I had gone to her to confirm that I was alive. Or maybe I was releasing my suppressed anger against her. That day I gently nestled close to Akiko. What was there to fear in two hurt animals cuddling together for warmth, licking each other's wounds? I said nothing, but carried on a long, intricate conversation with her body. And her body conveyed all sorts of meanings that had been lost to me when I was merely forcing myself on her. From that day, I felt a haunting loneliness whenever I was away from her. It seemed absurd to not have her by my side. Every part of her body had its own eloquent expression for me. I could see in my mind's eye the sinuously curving valley between her breasts, the slight hollow at her collarbone when she turned her neck. Then I would get up and head for the brothel-lined streets. As soon as I set foot in the quarter, I felt a sense of kinship with all the women who stood in the doorways of those tasteless, garishingly painted houses. I was at home with them. There was nothing serendipitous or guilty about me as I made my way towards Akiko's room. The women were kind to me. Apparently, it pleased them to know that I had a steady girl. Sometimes one of them would call out to me. How about trying me for a change? As I walked down these streets, mingled voices would pursue me. Once I heard a woman say, Take a turn around the block and then come back again, would you? I smiled wryly, remembering something that had happened earlier that afternoon. I had gone on assignment to see a certain personage. When the maid appeared, she stood in the doorway as if to block my way. The, the master is resting, she announced. Please take a walk around the block and then come back again. An experience like that would be forgotten the moment I reached the quarter. I would go into Akiko's room, not as a beaten dog, but as a human being. I had found a place of refuge and I was willing to enjoy it. In Akiko's room, I could recover my emotional equilibrium, but that didn't last. It was Akiko herself who threw me off balance. One day when I arrived, she turned to me with a vague smile and said, I'm sorry, I didn't think you'd be coming. I had been up with her the day before. Is your time all taken up? It's not that. I couldn't imagine what was bothering her. When I asked, she only smiled that vague smile. But when I touched her, I realized she was physically exhausted. Her body was mute. Usually her eyes would mist over with pleasure, but that day they were lifeless glass balls. If I had known you were coming, I wouldn't have let myself get so tired. I understood. Was Kuroda here? She had told me that a middle-aged man named Kuroda had become her best customer. Akiko hesitated. No, it was a stranger, a man I never saw before. A stranger? Somehow that irritated me. I thought I had protected myself by visiting a woman who could be bought for money, a woman I realized I would have to share with many men. I had known the pain of loving a woman and wasn't ready to expose myself to that again. Foolishly, I had thought that in Akiko's room I was safe. My irritation came from jealousy. In my student days, I had been in love with a girl who had a fiance. When I called at her house one evening, I saw a pair of brown leather shoes lying in the entryway. Evidently, the man they belonged to had arrived just ahead of me. The shoes had been kicked off casually. There they lay on the concrete floor, toes pointed towards the inner rooms, looking very much at home. I had never set eyes on this girl's fiancé, but I knew instinctively that his feet had been encased in those brown shoes until a moment ago. The way the shoes had been discarded showed me that he was on intimate terms with her family. I felt bitter jealousy towards those brown shoes. But because Akiko was a prostitute, a different kind of jealousy attacked me. Shaking her limp shoulders, I started to question her. What kind of a man? A big man? A sailor? Somebody built like a wrestler? Just an ordinary man. Do you get that tired with me? Akiko only smiled. I left Akiko's room. As usual, the narrow streets of the quarter were crowded. I stood in a corner and let my gaze wander over the streets. All those bodies moving along the streets were men. 
the bodies waiting in the dark rectangles of open doorways were women. That was ordinary enough here in the brothel quarter, but I found the notion strangely oppressive. If a man chose to stop before one of those waiting women, she would lead him to a secret room. Then, her body under his, she would willingly spread her legs. In the outside world, all sorts of complicated formalities had to be observed before two bodies meeting for the first time would arrive at this state. Such complications were the subject of innumerable stories. My own past jealousies grew from minor incidents of that kind. But now as I stood in a street corner gazing at the scene before me, I began to feel a new jealousy gnawing at me. I was possessed by the fantasy that, a, that the stranger who had exhausted Akiko was pressing deeper and deeper into her. The inmost, the inmost recesses of her flesh were being invaded. I knew my own body, and I thought I knew Akiko's body almost as well. Yet perhaps a minute part of her was still unknown to me. A small, dark part that I imagined beginning to expand. I felt violent jealousy towards that dark, moist part. After that, in Akiko's room, I was often aware of using brute force against her. Akiko's room was no longer a place of refuge. Sometimes, when I noticed that she was lying there exhausted, I would bend down to kiss the dark, sperm-scented part of her body as if to verify that it was I myself and not another man who had tired her. Still, I walked into the quarter as confidently as ever, and the prostitutes were kind to me. Summer passed, and autumn was near its end. The first night of the Torino Ichi Fair, I was in Akiko's room. Suddenly, Akiko said to me, I think I might give it up. Give what up? This business. But what would you do? Go to work in an office. Mr. Kurada says he can arrange it. You mean you're going to be Kurada's mistress? I guess you could call it that. He wants me to get out of here. I changed my line of questioning. Does this Mr. Kurada tire you? Mr. Kurada is a kind, generous person. He's considerate. He's always trying to help me. Akiko had graduated from a large city high school in Kansai. She could type in English and had a beautiful calligraphic hand. But I doubted that she could put up with regular office work, though I wasn't sure myself why I had such strong misgivings. Then Akiko said, Come along to the Torinoichi Fair. I want to buy a good luck rake. But that's for raking in more business for the next year, you know. Isn't that a bit odd to buy one just when you're planning to leave? Well, you never know. They say you have to get a bigger one every year. I could see it in my mind's eye, a full-size bamboo rank festooned with good luck charms. A treasure chest, a painted mask of a jolly fat woman and the like. And I winced at the thought of pushing my way through the crowd side by side with Akiko, carrying that big gaudy rake over my shoulder. But how big was the rake that Akiko bought last year? She must have it somewhere. I glanced around her room. Where's last year's rake? Over there. She pointed to a lintel beam behind me. A tiny, undercoated rake, no longer than the palm of my hand was wedged in by the handle. That's really a midget. How long have you been in the quarter? Mm, three years? Last year was the first time I bought a rake. Akiko and I left the house. On the fringe of the brothel quarter, a young hoodlum in sandals started talking to a woman whose dress seemed modeled to the curves of her body. Everything about her, the bare flesh of her shoulders, even the turn of her ankle above her black high-heeled shoes, emphasized her sexual function. It occurred to me that the lover of such a woman would have to transform himself into a gigantic penis. Physical deterioration for a woman like that would no doubt be slow. Perhaps the very fact of being here in the quarter would enable her to go on indefinitely radiating a fresh, youthful sensuality. I glanced at Akiko beside me. It was over a year since I had first met her. To me, she was beautiful. I didn't think she had deteriorated during the year. Still, I knew that I was in no position to make a cool judgment on any change in Akiko. Once again, I looked at her profile. Her skin seemed vulnerable to the grime of the quarters. Perhaps there was already a layer of grime deposited beneath it. Her heart seemed vulnerable, too. I recalled a touch of slackness in her breast. The bustling scene of the fair was just ahead of us. I stopped for a moment and said, You better not buy a rake this year. You ought to take Kurida more seriously. I do take him seriously, she replied, turning to wait for me. But I can't help feeling uneasy. Akiko disappeared from the quarter. She sent me the phone number of her office, but somehow I didn't want to call her. It bothered me to imagine her in a business office where every movement was supposed to be aimed at getting work done. Akiko's manner seemed proper enough, except when she was in bed. To look at her, you would just think she was an ordinary girl. In an office, though, some slight gesture of hers might stir a ripple of strangeness. If I telephoned her there, and she answered, wouldn't the people around her begin whispering together and exchanging glances? That would be painful for both of us. I didn't call Akiko, but I kept on visiting the quarters she had left. One after another, I went up to the rooms of the women I had come to know by sight. I never went to the same room more than once or twice. Still, all the women were kind to me. At the time, I could hardly understand why. Occasionally, I had the disturbing experience of seeking one of these prostitutes outside the quarter. I remember a strikingly beautiful woman who used to stand in the red and blue neon-tinted street full of confidence, her breasts held high, as she looked contemptuously at the men passing by. One summer day, I saw her while I was walking down a sloping road to a train station. The pavement reflected the midsummer sunlight, and dust glittered in the air. Bent over and trudging listlessly up the road, she had a baby strapped insecurely to her back, held by a black muslin band crisscrossed over her western-style dress. As we passed, I saw beads of sweat gathered on her forehead, 
and I thought I could hear her panting. The woman looked up at me. Her eyes were a yellowish, muddy color, with dark circles around them that made her look old. For an instant, those lusterless eyes met mine. There was no sign that she recognized me. One day, Akiko telephoned my office and said she'd like to meet me at noon Sunday. Hearing her voice for the first time in half a year, I had a premonition that her career as an office worker was nearing its end. Already, Akiko seemed to be emerging from the atmosphere of the office, beginning to escape from that stifling room. However, I didn't think she wanted to see me just to ask my advice about quitting her job. We met Sunday and had lunch together at a little restaurant downtown. Afterward, I suggested we go to a hotel. Akiko hesitated and then nodded. How's Kuroda? I inquired as we walked along. I've never been unfaithful to him before, she whispered, drawing a little closer to me. Not since I left the quarter. She seemed to regret our meeting, but once we were in the hotel room, I could hardly contain the violence of her body. At mid-afternoon, the hotel was almost empty. There were only the sound of a maid flailing away with her duster in the corridor outside our room and the creaking of our crude wooden bed. Even after I was lying still, the bed kept on creaking. Finally, Akiko lay exhausted beside me. She seemed embarrassed when she saw me looking at her. Will you go on working at the office? I asked for the first time. Akiko smiled and said nothing. That convinced me she would soon return to her old quarter, to the quarter I was still haunting. About half a month later, I found Akiko standing in the doorway of one of the houses, a different one from before. Just as I used to do, I nodded and followed her inside. When did you get back? I asked once we were in her room. Yesterday. Akiko put her arms around me and smiled. If I'd met you yesterday, she faltered, searching for the right phrase. I'd have eaten you alive. So today her hunger was not all that acute, and yesterday there was a man she ate alive. Probably he was a passing stranger, but even imagining her in the arms of that nameless man no longer gave me a twinge of jealousy. I looked into Akiko's eyes. Just then it seemed to me that the two of us, Akiko, a woman shaped by life in this quarter, a woman drawn back to it after once escaping, and myself, a man unable to give it up even after she left, were exchanging the look of accomplices. For the next year, I roamed the quarter, like a thoroughly dissolute pleasure seeker. I could close my eyes and visualize, and visualize a detailed map of the quarter. Nothing was missing, not least the alleyway or dustbin along the street. I was 25 and enjoyed posing as a libertine. I even felt a degree of passion. So there was bitterness in it, but there was also freshness. Sometimes I went back to Akiko's room. Her body was far too familiar to give me any new stimulation, and yet, for that very reason, even when I got so drunk as to be impotent with the other girls, in Akiko's room I would recover my virility. Once again, her room was my refuge. Akiko was always kind and indulgent. When my money ran out, I would spend the night with her, leaving my raincoat or my watch as security. There was a time when all my small personal possessions ended up there, and the next morning she put breakfast money in my hand. Akiko continued to indulge me, but one day I learned that her interest in me had cooled. She had fallen in love. Oh, he's young. Younger than you. What about Kuroda? Mr. Kuroda is a kind, sympathetic man. He's always trying to help. He wants to get me out of the quarter again. I was a flop as an office girl, so this time he's found me a place in a bar. He's rented an apartment for me, too. Then all you have to do is leave. That's right. Come see me at the bar, won't you? I'll call you from there. It was a full year since Akiko's return to the quarter, and now she was leaving again. Akiko telephoned to let me know the bar's address. To my surprise, it was tucked away just off a prosperous shop, shopping street downtown. I went to visit the bar and found Akiko sitting in a corner, bored. As soon as she saw me, she hurried over with a look of relief on her face. I sat down at the bar and began drinking steadily. Akiko sat beside me. We said nothing, though the other customers and their hostesses were joking and flirting in the usual lively, innocuous way. It occurred to me that Akiko's conversations with her customers in the quarter had been of a rather different kind. No doubt, since coming to this bar, she had merely sat beside her customers, smiling that vague smile as of hers. Finally, I asked how things were going. It's not so easy here. I was silent. Mr. Kurita gets mad and says I'm always complaining. He knows a school for fashion models. He keeps telling me I ought to try it. The instant I heard that, I felt a chill come over me. I saw Akiko exactly how she was. If Kuroda had suggested a few years ago, before she came to the quarter, it wouldn't have seemed so incongruous. But now it was downright cruel. Could she be aware of that? Probably not. The thought gave me a dark, wretched feeling, a feeling of bitter disappointment. I had the impression that the grime of the quarter was beginning to show through Akiko's skin. She alone in the bar seemed to be under a curious shadow. But did Kuroda herself realize the cruelty of what he had said? Having once tried to rescue her and failed, and on the verge of failing again, how did he feel towards Akiko? Could he be so blindly in love with her? The second time I visited the bar, Akiko was already gone. I hadn't, I hadn't asked for the address of her apartment, and she didn't telephone me. She had disappeared without a trace. As usual, I went on roaming the brothel quarter that Akiko had deserted a second time. Three years had passed since my first visit to Akiko's room. There were always new faces among the women in front of the houses, and fewer and fewer women I had known for a long time. And there was a change in me as well. In the old days, I would slink in like a beaten dog, nestling up to a sad, sympathetic whore so that we could lick each other's wounds. I felt no difference between myself and the quarter. Later, I stirred around the corner in the pose of a libertine. Straining every nerve and maintaining that pose, I would scrumptiously eye the woman with as much passion as I could muster. 
And now my attitude had changed. My wretchedness and disappointment in Akiko at the bar had darkened my vision of the quarter. This wretchedness was different from the kind I had nested close to. I stood on a safe, slightly higher ground looking down on it. I was no longer at home in the brothel quarter. The neon-tinted streets had begun to fade before my eyes. My change in feeling toward Akiko had become a change in attitude toward the quarter. I never believed that my feeling toward any one woman would go on indefinitely the same way, with the same intensity. So perhaps the ordinary passage of time had brought that change. Yet it may have also reflected a change in my life. The company where I worked at was becoming prosperous. As one of its staff members, I was treated more respectfully by the people I had to deal with, and there were fewer humiliations. I couldn't simply call it my own good fortune. Perhaps this also has something to do with my changed attitude toward the quarter. Out of habit, I kept on haunting the brothel quarter that was fading before my eyes. I had the casual hope that, among the many women waiting there, I might find one whose body would bring me unexpected delight. But the woman began to grow cold towards me, not that they realized I had changed. Even the woman I had never met before would treat me with the typical cold spitefulness of a whore. I often tasted the bitterness of the quarter. I thought that if I could be more passionate in my search for a body to delight me, I might escape with fewer unpleasant encounters. But that hope was just as elusive. I would follow a woman into her room. Already my lust would begin to cool. I would think of Akiko and remember that while she was here, I could keep my lust alive, that my strength would ebb away completely. One night, I was a little drunk. I was walking through the quarter. I approached a woman and followed her inside. As I stood in the doorway to her room, I recalled that I had visited her before. I had been impotent. Hesitant, I muttered, tonight might be no good either. The woman heard me and peered in my face. She remembered. Suddenly, she threw off her meek, gentle manner and shrilled out, Why did you come here? Go home! She shoved me back along the hall to the top of the stairs and then gave me another push with all her strength. Half stumbling, I went careening down the stairs. A handful of salt came pelting after me as I struggled onto my shoes to escape. The white crystals were sprinkled all over my head and shoulders. As I was passing Akiko's old house, the only woman I still knew there called out to me. Akiko's back. Where? She named a house that had the same owner. Akiko's the madam, so Akiko is running it. I walked over to the house repeating to myself, Akiko's the madam. Turning in at a narrow lane, I went in back around to the back door. Through a lattice window, I could see Akiko inside, bent over an abacus. She was wearing red-rimmed glasses. When I tapped on the window pane, Akiko turned and saw me. She smiled, took off her glasses, and let me in through the back door. Here I am again, she said, still smiling. What happened to your lover? I asked, thinking of her young man. That's all over. He gave me a terrible time. I'm not so young myself anymore. I can't go on forever standing out in the street. Akiko glanced around the room that seemed to be her office. I couldn't find anything to say. Akiko broke the silence. Now he tells me I ought to try opening a tobacco shop. Who tells you? Mr. Kuroda. Oh, does Kuroda know about your young man? Somehow it leaked out. You ought to let him set you up with a shop. I suppose so. Once I'm out of here, I've got to get myself fixed up. Something's wrong with my uterus. You should take care of yourself. I left Akiko and walked through the brothel quarter towards the streets beyond it. I was thinking about Kuroda. He never changed. And I? The quarter no longer needed me, and I no longer needed the quarter. Filled with self-loathing, I hurried away. Translated by Howard Hibbett. For the, uh, you can edit this part out. Di the I read two pages and then realized that instead of the pause button, I had stopped recording. So I read here to a camera that was turned off in an empty room by myself for no reason. Anyway, let's begin. I did it again, I pressed the wrong button. I had become her best. In my student days, I had been in love with a girl who had a fiance. Ooh. <laughs> oh boy. Oh, you poor bastard. I'm getting a phone call. Moshi moshi. It was um, not for me. I never set eyes on this girl's fiance, but I knew instinctively that his feet had been encased in his brown shoes until a moment ago. Okay, genius. Yeah, they're out. These shoes, they were warm. That was ordinary enough here in the brothel quarter, but I found the notion strangely oppressive. <laughs> now you do. Now when, <laughs> now when your prostitute cheated on you? Yeah, perhaps a, min a minute part of her was still I known. I known? I known. Unknown. Physiology, we had no problem, but unknown. Unknown, that's a hard word. I felt violent jealousy towards that dark, moist part. Ew. Ew, 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 ew. I would bend down to kiss... Okay. And the prostitutes were kind to me. Of course they are, you're paying money. But yeah, they're nice to you. They know Akiko's getting her bag. Even the turn of her ankle above her mid-high-heeled shoes. Mid? No, they're black. Oh my god. So sorry, random lady in the store. For an instant, those lusterless eyes met mine. There was no sign that she recognized me. Why would she? Now that they realized I had changed. Oh, didn't they? Right, okay. Ah! They don't get it. They don't get it. You're so smart. You're so smart. Okay. You called her a whore, and then you don't get why she doesn't like you. Come on. 